Hello, welcome to the Critical Accounting Podcast. My name is James Brackley. I'm here with Joanna Cherasalakish, who's just presented at the Ethics of Care stream at EGOS 2023. Um, you have a new paper in Global Political Economy entitled The Centrality of Disablement Subjectivization to the Reproduction of Capitalist Social Relations. And that's part of a um, part of your uh, doctoral project, Politics of Disablement and Precarious Work. That's a public facing project, and you've got the Twitter account at disprecwork and the website disprecwork.wordpress.com. Uh, and as part of your doctoral program, you've in, done interviews with uh, disabled people who are in the gig economy doing various forms of gig economy work. Uh, you've got really interesting interviews and, and diary data. And in the initial paper that you've published in Global Political Economy, you've introduced these really interesting concepts of subjects of disablement, disabling capitalism, developing post-68 Marxist approaches to the social model, model of disability, um, building on disability composition in light of class composition. And you've also got a forthcoming piece that you're working on introducing the concept of collective materialist approaches to disablement. I'll start by asking you a bit more about some of these concepts, the subjects of disablement. Um, why is that a sort of a useful way to think about disability versus maybe more individualized or medicalized approaches to disability? Um, so subjects of disablement is a concept that I have um developed um, as a result of me um, conducting the research pro project um, The Politics of Disablement and Precarious Work. Um, and in this project I interviewed uh, people who self-identified as being either uh, disabled and or um, having impairments, having experiences of mental distress, um, being chronically ill or neurodivergent. And um, I was very interested as part of this project in uh, trying to find the commonality uh, between all the research participants and, and beyond um, of, of people, all the, these groups of people um, and, and what, what it means to live under capitalism and what, what the commonality and, and potential um, uh, ways of uh, bridging solidarity between um, everyone there could be. So. Um, I then um, asked questions about uh, self-identification uh, in, in the interviews and I found that all participants um, used self-identifying identity terms um, often interchangeably um, or they were skeptical of the term disabled for a variety of reasons um, or of other terms as well and so I then and my data um, and the interviews and I realized that uh, one of the main things that was discussed and, and um, reiterated throughout the interviews and diary entries um, is the fact that all participants were uh, subjected to um, forms of oppression uh, that are uh, that arise through disablement. Um, so um, as a result I then uh, engaged with the uh, class composition theory which posits that um, we've got the technical composition of class and the political composition of class um, and I um, transferred it and thought about it in, in the context of disability politics. So the subjects of disablement is everyone who um, under capitalism um, has impairments, is chronically ill, um, is deaf, um, neurodivergent and, and so on. Um, and they or we are all subjected to disablement. Um, and then for the political composition of disability, um, we've got uh, the self-organized collective groups um, who actively organize against and beyond disablement um, and uh, yeah so, so that, that's partly why I um, uh, proposed the term subjects of disablement. Um, it is a non-identitarian term um, so it's not concerned with whether or not someone identifies as being a subject of disablement um, because of the way in which society is structured, you are subjected to disablement, regardless of whether or not you know that um, you know you have a particular impairment or um, you, you are subjected to oppression or exploitation. 
So is this kind of linked to this idea of disability in itself and then um, disability for itself being the kind of the political consciousness and where uh, maybe the, the political mobilisation comes from, is, is that right? Um, yes, so that's a different um, way of thinking about uh, disability and especially about class. Um, so we've got class in itself and for itself. Um, and But the pro there is a problem with this way of thinking about class because it relies on a psychologized approach of consciousness um, and of, of being aware of, of, of one being uh, oppressed and exploited. So um, because of that, um, I uh, did not engage with class um, uh, consciousness theory, but with class composition theory. Um, so, and, and I would I would um, posit that the UPS inspired social modelists, so the the kind of the literature that I'm engaging with, has um, over time used the disability um, a consciousness approach. So I'm just tweaking slightly um, what they are proposing and and using the class composition theory to talk about disability composition. So in that way, you're kind of developing the social model in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of disabling capitalism um, and your analysis, why is it important to think about disability in the context of like capitalist social relations? Like, why can't we just think about like discrimination on the basis of ability or a more kind of identity based understanding of disability? Um, it's because I argue and I develop my, my ideas, of course, based on, on uh, the work of many disabled activists and scholars. Um, and I posit that um, it, is disa it is capitalism itself that has created um, disablement. And disablement is a fundamental feature of capitalism. There is no disablement without capitalism. And um, I am not saying that uh, there didn't used to be people with impairments, for instance, before the emergence of capitalism. That's not uh, my argument at all. Um, but the argument instead is that with the emergence of capitalism, uh, people with impairments um, who are deaf and uh, who have experience of chronic illness and other groups um, have been collectively thought about and, and um, kind of treated in a way that is oppressive and exploitative and um, a fundamental part of this uh, exclusion social exclusion for instance is the um, creation of the wage system and of, um, uh, of of work of the institution of work that is still predominant today um, so then we've got this idea of uh, false idea of the able to body person um, and then the, the, the other person who is not uh, productive and who is uh, subjected to disablement. So this idea of productivity is very crucial to how sort of disablement is, is, is enacted, I guess, um, and, and it's kind of historically um, situated. Yeah. Is that kind of your own Okay. Um, I mean, that's fantastic in terms of how you're developing that theoretically uh, and bringing that into the discussion. And am I right in saying kind of updating the kind of the social model and developing the social model in terms of post-68 Marxisms? Yes. Um, I am developing the social model and um, also trying through the project to offer a theory of, of um, disablement. Um, and this is partly because the social modelists, um, so the social modelists are, um, or, or the social model itself was created in the 1970s by uh, an activist group of disabled um, uh, people uh, called the UPS, the Union of Physically Impaired um, Against Segregation. And they developed this model through which we understand disability as being uh, something imposed on people by society. So people with impairments are disabled by society. Now, um, I go further or I take um, this stance to talk about how, how capitalism itself disables society um, and, and what it disables uh, people with impairments and who are neurodivergent and so on. And um, I have also noticed in the literature um, of the social model of disability that uh, very often activists and scholars have said that there hasn't been anyone who's uh, put together an actual theory of, of disability or disablement. A model is uh, um, 
akin to a theory, but it's more uh, pragmatic and it's it's preoccupied with how to um, take action in order to change a particular facets of society. But what is still needed is um, a theory of disablement. So I am indebted to the UPS inspired social modelists and um, I'm just trying to use and update some of the literature and arguments uh, with post Marxist, uh, post 68 Marxist um, scholarship. Fantastic. Um, and we've just come from the EGOS conference, in fact, we're still at the EGOS conference 2023, and, and the, on, in the ethics of care stream, uh, there's a big discussion around care, how we think about care in, in organisations, in, in all sorts of research. Um, and one thing I found really interesting about your presentation is, first of all, you disability was often largely absent from that discussion, um, but also how disabled people are more than just the passive recipients of care and how care needs to be more than just a kind of a transactional uh, model or consumer model of care. Um, so could you tell a bit, us a bit more about how you conceptualise care and you also touch on something called the work transfer thesis? Yes. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about that as well? Thank you. Um, so in, in social sciences literature, um, very often uh, disabled people or the subjects of disablement and also disability more generally are omitted and when they are mentioned it's usually through a very individualistic lens um, and disablement is not considered uh, or not taken into account as a, as a structural feature of capitalism. Um, so that is incredibly problematic and it reproduces uh, disabled assumptions um, in, in these um, theories um, and scholarship. And at the same time, um, within disability studies, Marxism has been largely abandoned and sidelined, um, especially over the past 20 years. Uh, so disability studies, especially from the 70s onwards, um, used to be based quite um, heavily within um, emancipatory and, and Marxist um, approaches. Um, however, it's, it's, this is not the case anymore. So what I'm trying to do is address both these field, quite uh, large fields, try to bring them together um, and also update uh, some theories of disablement. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And I think also from my perspective, it's also often absent from kind of management, organizational studies, critical accounting literature as well. So I think what you're doing is you're really giving us a way of kind of really thinking critically about disability and disablement. Uh, and then we can use that to bring it into a whole wide range of areas. So I think it, your stuff's really fantastic in that respect. Um, I want to ask a bit more about your data. So you did interviews with um, subjects of disablement who um, worked in a variety of kind of gig economy uh, type jobs, um, and you also looked at some of the unpaid and unwaged work that, that, that those people did as part of your research. Um, could you tell us a bit more about, because there's this idea that the gig economy is you know, great for disabled people, it's really flexible, they can choose their hours of work, there's no commitment. Um, what was your findings f from your project? Um. I, so I interviewed 27 uh, gig economy workers who um, were working at the time of the interviews um, in various industries and um, they were on various types of contracts or work arrangements, um, all based in UK. And um, whilst it is the case that uh, shorter working hours and particular um, ways of um, organising work are part of the gig economy and they may suit uh, some people. Um, the gig economy work itself is um, incredibly exploitative and um, you know you have fixed instances of low pay um, and uh, people not being paid on time or at all um, and people being expected to uh, work uh, for free to, to spend much more time than uh, they are paid for. Um, and so um, that's that's one of the um, kind of findings from the project, um, and it is 
it is incredibly problematic to um, say that, um, and there have been arguments made by some um, think tanks, for instance, to say that disabled people in particular should um, opt for the gig economy work, um, because that means that um, there is the assumption that the, uh, the subjects of disablement uh, cannot or should not be uh, undertaking full-time work. Um, and also, it, if you do gig economy work, um, you, it's very likely that you wouldn't have access to reasonable adjustments or any other things that, any other perks and benefits of full-time employment and secure employment. Um, what I've also found and also engaged with literatures around this topic is that, um, this idea that if you're unemployed or if you're a gig economy worker, you have more, presumably more time because you're not in as much waged work as full-time workers. This is not the case um, because you are made, or like again, under a capitalist society, uh, you're made to work, you're forced into work, both paid and unpaid, uh, on a daily basis. So um, I argue, among other things, that unemployed people work, and, and gig economy um, workers work more than uh, in, in particular instances than full-time workers because you're made to, for instance, um, do job searches for uh, the state, for the DWP, uh, Department of Work and Pensions, uh, in exchange for social security and you need to cons constantly prove yourself and prove to various bureaucrats that you are indeed disabled um, and that you fit the Equality Act um, definition of, of, of being disabled. And um, there is, the participants expressed um, very uh, clearly the fact that they did not have time to rest, they did not have time to um, uh, take care of themselves, for instance, um, when when needed. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what, yeah. yeah. So disabled people are kind of like forced into this kind of work and then there's all this kind of work transfer of unwaged work, almost kind of punitively forced upon people and then it's like their value is, am I right in saying, almost defined in terms of their productivity uh, and that's like also really problematic because mm -hmm. that's kind of part of what you're saying, isn't it? Definitely. And I, uh, one of the questions I asked in the interview was, um, interviews was about, um, productivity. So how did the participants, um, understand, um, or how did they think that various, um, actors in society, um, define productivity? How they define it themselves? And what, um, else could be, um, used as a principle for valuing people in society mm. and um, most participants were, were very clearly um, against the productivism of of, um, uh, of of our society and in terms of work transfer you, you mentioned uh, like a key concept there um, I am um, indebted to the um, scholarship and theory of work transfer developed by uh, Nona Glazer, a Marxist feminist and um, also developed and built upon by um, Kirsten Munro, um, who is also a Marxist feminist. Um, and through this um, idea of work transfer, we uh, find that um, work is um, transferred, is usually top down, um, from one sphere of activity to another and from one particular group uh, to others. So an example, a very kind of... Um, uh, clear example is the work that uh, we now do for as, as like self checkout in the supermarkets. It used to be done by waged workers, and yet now um, Nona Glazer argues that it's house, house um, workers and women who do this work for free without uh, compensation, and this unwaged work contributes to the reproduction of capitalist social relations, um, to the creation of surplus value, um, is just not remunerated. And I argue that this is also the case in um, in the case of uh, the subjects of disablement and the work that they undertake. And in addition to um, Glazer's work, I also um, argue that work transfer is not uh, just a unidirectional process. Um, it happens both from above as well as from below. So when we organize collectively against um, top-down transfers of work, especially for instance through austerity, we've seen that um, a lot, um, 
we can um, reverse the process and, and um, make sure that we have resources for um, various things, including organizing and um, resting. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thanks so much for speaking to us at the podcast, at the Critical Accounting Podcast. Um, and just a reminder, you've got a new paper in Global Political Economy that's the centrality of disablement subjectification to the reproduction of capitalist social relations. And you've got your public facing project, the politics of disablement and precarious work. Um, and yeah, I just maybe finish on, I think, in terms of thinking more deeply about disability so that it's more than just kind of a tick in a box, another category in the Equalities Act. If we want to think more deeply about disability as a form of subjectification, what you're providing, I think, is just a hugely rich and valuable resource. So please check out Joanna's work and uh, thanks for watching this episode of the podcast. Thank you.